Okay, afternoon everyone. Um, just wanted to wrap up a bit of what our discussion was on Wednesday. It's been covered in the tutorials, the Thursday and the Friday tutorial now. I just wanted to put it here just to be conclusive in the course time that when we're looking at these payback metrics and NPV and ROI and DCFRR, it, it should have been apparent based on the example we looked at at the end of class on Wednesday as well as the tutorial questions that there's a variety of these ways that we can judge a project. There isn't a single one number that we always use. So the two numbers that we should use are the NPV, and we use that because it covers the lifetime of the equipment at an interest rate I that we pick, or as I'll say more carefully going forward, not at an interest rate I, but at a time value of money. So I'll come back to that in a second. But NPV takes, remember, the N, capital N, the, the number of periods into account, and the interest rate. And it brings it to today's terms. <coughs> DCFRR is a number that we use to simply ensure that we're above what our company's acceptable investment criterion is. So projects that, that meet those two criteria are projects that we will pick. We don't like to use ROI and we don't like to use payback time because they don't account for the time varying value of money. Okay, that's the key, key reason. If you were personally evaluating projects on a very short term basis, projects whose lifetimes are over a year or two years, you're not going to be wrong by you considering payback. But payback doesn't consider the time value of money, and payback also doesn't consider what happens after you've paid that item back. After you've paid that item back, it may well still generate more revenues for you. So considering payback time is really a naive approach. Okay. So there are more sophisticated ways to do this, and NPV and DCFRR are the two numbers we're going to use. The reason why we like to use NPV is because it brings all our considerations that we're, we're um, considering to today's point of reference. And why are we doing this? Well, we need to invest that money today. That's really the only reason why. We have to make a decision today on which projects to invest in. So if we take our option A, B, C, D, and however many options we've got available to us and bring them all into money's value right now, we can make a fair comparison between them. Now, this plays into the idea of an NPV equals to zero. That's always a possibility. NPV equals zero dollars was a consideration I'd asked you to, to look at in the tutorial. And an NPV of zero dollars has a special meaning. Okay. Many of you have covered some, some really, really interesting nuances about an NPV of zero related to competitors and so forth and experience gained. But I want to look at NPV purely from an investment point of view. Right? So if you're, if you're sitting on some money and you can either not invest it or you can invest it in one project. Okay, let's take a look at the non-investment case. The case of where you just sit on your money and don't spend it, that is NPV equals to zero. Okay? Because if you're not spending your money, your cash flow in period C0 is zero dollars. Your cash flow at time one in period one is zero dollars. Your cash flow in all future periods is zero dollars. So no matter how you discount that, the net present value of sitting on your money is zero. You've neither made a loss, but you've not made any money either. You've got no profit made from that. Okay, so that is always a valid project is to do nothing with your money. Yes, Nicole. Okay, wouldn't you technically lose money into infl due to infl deflation? Deflation, okay. So the answer is why that's not the case is because when we calculate this NPV, the key is we're doing it at I equals the MARR. Okay? And the MARR is determined by the company's finance department and wraps up 
all the possibilities of various revenue sources that the company can get their money from. And the companies will also add in a deflationary aspect to that. Okay, so the MARR is the minimal acceptable return. If you're doing better than that percentage, that's great. But when the company establishes the MARR, they're considering all their possible sources of finance. Okay, so if, you're, if the company says, I've got a million dollars and chooses nothing to do, chooses to do nothing with it, they could invest that money at those interest rates, but that money will also deflate at the same value that it's appreciating. So you'll earn the interest on that money, but will also devalue at that same rate. So you still get an NPV of zero. Okay, so a company that sits on a million dollars or a, an amount of money will grow that money at that interest rate, but it will deflate at that exact same rate. So they've ended up with zero, a cash flow of zero. So that's always a valid alternative, is to do nothing with your money. The other alternatives might be to buy a distillation column, buy a pump, use that money to grow it in some way. Okay? And then as some groups pointed out, by choosing not to do a project, you don't gain the experience of doing that work. You leave the market open to a competitor to come in and do that work. So the cost of not investing might actually be greater than just simply sitting on your money. Yeah. So by sitting on your money, you mean by investing in a bank Right, by, by putting it in a bank account that offers that MAR. But it's a little bit more subtle than that because in a big company, it just simply means that you don't take money from your investors. Okay? Uh, but essentially, you can interpret it as that. Okay, so the key thing I want you to consider from this point onwards in the course is when we refer to I, that interest rate, always use MARR as that I. That time value of money, we'll call that our TVM rate. Time value of money rate is I is MARR. Okay, and I'll, I'll give that to you always. Okay, it will be apparent in the question what that is. The reason why I explained it to you at the start of this course as an interest rate on earned on money or as the deflation of money if you're doing nothing with it is because it helps from a conceptual point of view to see that money can either grow or shrink in value over time. But it was a conceptual idea that I just wanted you to, to, to grasp the concept with. Now I'm going to ask you to consider I as this value, this number that's determined internal from a company. And it's, it's, it's apparent always in, in a company what that would be. Okay, is that, that's a bit of a subtlety um, in this course that, that people sometimes struggle with. Any questions on that? Or comments? Okay. Let's take a look now at what really is actually quite interesting is the idea of taxes and depreciation. Okay, so how many, of, how many of you know or understand the concept of depreciation? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have heard the word depreciation? Okay, so we're comfortable with the, the general maybe idea of depreciation. Let's, let's look into that in today's class. And then taxes we're all very comfortable with because we've all paid taxes. Now, I, I will emphasize when we get to taxes here that we're not talking about HST. Okay, we're talking about income taxes. So, when you earn income, you pay on your tax return to the government once per year. You either hand over money to them or they, or they give you a refund. Okay. We're referring to those types of taxes. Corporations also pay that sort of tax. And I'll get to that in a minute. So when we, when we talk about taxes from a corporate point of view, the government sees corporations as people. They're legal entities. A corporation can enter into contracts. 
they can engage with other corporations. So from the government's perspective, corporations are really no different to people. And as a result of that, the government also charges them taxes. So a corporation will file an annual income tax. It's called a T2. You file a T1. In Canada, a corporation files a T2. And depending on where you are in the country, that tax rate will be a little bit different. But I would like you to prove to yourself by going to the CRA website, Canada Revenue Agency, CRA. And if you look up the tax rate, you won't find 25%. The advertised tax rate is higher. But there's always tax breaks available in the order of 14 to 15% tax breaks. And then the province that you're operating in will charge tax as well. In Ontario, the net effect of all these confusing taxes for a corporation is about 25%. Okay. So this number is not correct, but that's not the purpose of this course. Our purpose here is to understand the effect of taxation, and 25% is about right. It will vary. It will be a lot higher in British Columbia. It is a lot lower in Alberta. It's about 25% in Ontario. And so the general concept is going to work out OK. And if you're working in a, in a different country in the world, you'll be looking that up anyway. So I would like you to go search for that tax rate and see how I got to that 25 and see if you can agree with me there. Depreciation is a concept that, as you indicated with your hands, many of you are familiar with. Um, this, you've all heard that expression, you drive off a, a car, a, a, you buy a new car, you drive off the, the lot of the dealership and the car has lost so many thousand dollars in value. That's the idea of depreciation. Certain cars will depreciate faster than other cars. They lose their value faster than other cars. Okay, what do we mean by that reduction in value of a car? Why do different cars depreciate faster than others? Any suggestions? Type of engine, yeah. Yeah. So VWs, Mercedes, they don't depreciate as fast as some of the other brands. Yeah. Expected maintenance costs are wrapped up into that. Resale values of the car later on, four or five years down the line. There's many complexities that factor into depreciation of an actual product. In this course, and this always gets a bit of a confusion going, there is depreciation, and we're going to set it at a fixed percentage. The actual depreciation that's experienced on a product is different. But what we're, not we're not concerned about what the actual depreciation is, and nor is the government. The government is only interested in a theoretical depreciation of the object. The government doesn't care if you go resell your distillation column after you've used it for 10 years and what value you get for that distillation column. The government knows, however, that that 10 million distillation column that you've purchased is not worth 10 million a few years from now. Okay? Its value declines. And the government tells you what percentage decline it will go at. It's 30%. Every year, it will reduce in value by 30%. So the government dictates to you what that depreciation rate is. Whether the depreciation that they dictate accurately reflects the value of the product really doesn't matter. Depreciation is simply an accounting artifact that we're going to have to try and understand. Yeah. We'll get to that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so 30% of what we'll, we'll show why that is. Okay, and the government does this because really if you think of it, it is, a, it is fair in some way. If you take a distillation column, you expect it to last for a good number of years. Let's say it lasts 20 years and you've paid $20 million for it today. So I go buy a new distillation column today for $20 million. I know it will last 20 years. Crudely, you're immediately thinking I can maybe consider the cost of that distillation column as $1 million per year. Okay, and then after 20 years, it's added up to the price I paid for it. Okay? 
And this is, that's kind of the right thinking, except it's not a linear change over time. We're going to use an exponential change over time. But the idea of depreciation allows you as a company to write off the value of a piece of equipment over a period of time. And the government lets you do that because they recognize that piece of equipment has a lifetime longer than one year. So that $20 million distillation column I buy today, it really isn't that fair to have on my accounting records an expense of $20 million, even though the next year I'm going to have an expense of $0 and 0, 0, 0 after that. So the government says, well, okay, I get that this distillation column is going to last you a long time. I'm going to let you write off some amount this year, some amount the next year, some amount, some amount, some amount, so that going far enough over time, it will add up to $20 million. But they don't do it linearly. They do it on an exponentially declining basis. Okay? So e depreciation helps make accounting a little bit more fair by recognizing that equipment lasts over a longer period of time. Now, does the government let you depreciate your car? You buy a new car for $40,000. Does the government say you can write off the value of your car over a period of time in small amounts? Okay. The government is very unfair when it comes to personal taxes versus individual taxes. You cannot do that. But if you use your car for your own business that you've incorporated, then you can. Okay? Do you pay taxes on your car? No, but does the government charge a company taxes for the products that they buy? Not either, okay? So, what's the point of depreciation in your car if the government doesn't charge you anything? On okay, we'll, I'll show you the equation and that will help explain it, okay? So you can argue that this is not fair, that the government has a different set of rules for corporations as they do for individuals. Companies are charged a lower tax rate than individuals. Okay, so, so that's also true is that you will pay personally, will pay more taxes than a corporation, and corporations get better breaks. There's another interesting way that the government reduces tax for a, a company. Let me perhaps jump over two slides to answer Rahima's question, and I'll come back to the prior slide. So, when the government sets the rules, we have to play by those rules, and the government's rules are as follows. You as the corporation are going to pay tax. There's the left-hand side. The moment you give a corporation an equation like this, they're going to do anything possible to decrease that tax. Look at that equation for a minute. If you were a company, what would you do there to pay less tax? Yeah. Increase your expenses. Okay. If you can increase your expenses to match your income, how much tax are you going to pay? Does the government let you do that on your tax return? Okay. If they did that, the government would get zero tax dollars. Okay. So a corporation, they can spend money to offset their income and they'll pay no tax. You can be sure that because a corporation can, re can calculate depreciation, they're going to make sure they put that value on their T2 tax return. They're not going to like, ah, oh, I'll just forget about depreciation. Okay? They're going to make sure that they calculate depreciation so that they pay less tax. And a corporation is going to do anything possible to be in a lower tax bracket at a lower tax rate. Okay? So it is perfectly legal to minimize your taxes. It's illegal to avoid paying tax, or to um, illegally get out of paying taxes, but to avoid tax and minimize it in a legal way is perfectly acceptable. And it, the tax code is very complex. There's lots of different ways that you can move around this and reduce your tax rate. And here's a key word, 
eligible expenses. So the government doesn't let you deduct any expenses. They only let you deduct eligible expenses. OK, what's eligible? Well, the moment that the government is involved with taxes, you can be sure that you're going to be very specific about what is on this side of the equation. So let's go look. Eligible expenses. Let's go back to the previous slide I skipped over. Eligible expenses are all expenses that are not here on the slide. So I'll, let's, let's look, look at it in reverse. So when you spend money on a distillation column, as an example, you're buying that column. It's called a capital item. That's, that's the terminology. Equipment is of called what's called a capital nature or a capital good. So you're purchasing a capital good, and you can depreciate that good as defined by the government. The government gives you rules. That equipment must meet these three criteria. The equipment must be used to produce income. You can't just go around buying stuff and just putting it in your storage. Okay? You can't just go buy a distillation column and leave it in your, in your company's warehouse right? or a heat exchanger or a pump. When you buy that pump, it has to be in service for this to be triggered. It must have a life longer than one year. And it must lose value over time. Okay? So those three criteria define when a good is eligible for depreciation. And let's take a look at that. Yeah, Sean. There's, there's some goods, but there's one particular good that never loses value. Land. Land never loses value, and the government does not allow you to depreciate land. Okay. So that's one good that the gar you guaranteed. Yeah. So is this only to companies and only, we're not talking about personal tax returns here. This is only corporations. Okay, so go through that list and discuss with the person next to you which of those can be depreciated by Suncor or Petro-Canada or Faceless Corporation, um, and which cannot be. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through that list. Can the CEO's cell phone be depreciated? The CEO's cell phone, used for business purposes only. Okay, it's used for production of income, has a life longer than one year, and you certainly cannot sell it for the same price you bought it for. Okay, Laptops, com laptop computers and printers. Okay, printer paper. No. Distillation column and pumps. Yes. yes. Salaries. No. no. Office building. Yes. Can be depreciated. Yes. The land that the building is on. No. no. Okay. So this is easy. CEO's jet. Yeah. Okay. It's used for generating income. Hopefully. <laughs> company travel. So that first class ticket that the company pays for you to go to South America. 
No, it doesn't have a life longer than one year. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll come to that, yeah. Internet connection fees, utilities, electricity, water, insurance, salaries. So anything you said no to is an, is an eligible expense. So eligible expenses are internet connection fees, printed paper, that's eligible. Okay? The monthly cell phone contract fee that you pay to Bell, not for the phone, but for the connection and the data, that is eligible. The phone is not eligible, but the data plan is eligible. The printer paper is not is the printer paper is eligible. The printer is not eligible. Okay. The distillation column is not eligible. The electricity to run the distillation column is eligible. So between the two categories, you can fit in all your expenses. You can always be one or the other. Yeah. Okay. So here's the key criterion. Eligible expenses are those that are just ongoing basis, they're short, short term. Ineligible expenses are expenses related to the cost of the equipment installing it. Okay. The design of that equipment. I thought I had a slide here on this. Okay, there it is. So slide 74, two slides down, gives you that distinction. Yes, Joseph. Uh, you said at the beginning that uh, instead of getting the $20 million back in bulk at the beginning, you get it depreciated over time, and yeah. you implied that that was better. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't, from an MPV perspective, we want that bulk? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to have you do a question on that in the next tutorial to prove it. Okay, so when we say something is expensed, it means that the full cost of it is re de deducted in the year that that expenses incurred. So if you buy the printer paper this year, you can expense that. It's an eligible expense. And so most things are in fact eligible expenses. Most companies expenses are eligible. Salaries, utilities, raw material, insurance, property taxes, all those regular expenses that you've saw on the tutorial in question three or four this week, those are eligible expenses. Okay. Anything that is not capital related. Well, what is capital related? Capital related means that the expense is due to a capital investment. It means the expense is of a lasting nature. It gives you permanent recurring value. So a capital expense is a distillation column itself. It's going to last many years. The government says, no, you cannot reduce your income with that distillation column. Why? The government is smart. They always get their money. If the government let you expense that distillation column, companies would be buying hundreds of distillation columns just to reduce their income. Okay? So the government says, well, that distillation column is not only of value to you this period, it's also going to give you value next period and the period after. I'm still going to let you reduce your income with depreciation, but I'm going to let you do it in a, in a controlled, declining manner. And I'll show you how that looks now. So the equipment is an ineligible expense. You cannot put the equipment in that column. You cannot put improvements to the equipment. Design, engineering, shipping that equipment, installing the equipment, because shipping the equipment to your site and installing it, it has a lasting value. That value of that shipping and installation occurs over many periods of time. If you have to make changes to your building and land to get that equipment installed, that's also ineligible. The only thing that can be expensed is land. Land is never depreciated. It is expensed. So if you have to buy a $100,000 piece of land next to your site to expand, that, that $100,000 is an eligible expense, but it's not depreciated. Yeah, all the work you do to get that equipment shipped, installed, up and running, even the design that you pay to some other third-party design company to get it up and running, 
all of that gets accumulated and becomes the value of that piece of equipment. And the government says, okay, now you've got this summed up value, I'm going to allow you to depreciate that value. So the, the value that you're going to depreciate isn't just the equipment itself, it's everything to get that equipment up and running. Designed, built, up and running. Okay? And the government is pretty smart on this because of this criteria that it must be used for producing income. You only get to depreciate the equipment from the day that equipment is running on your site. So that reboiler that you've bought two years ago and sitting in your warehouse that you're taking your time to install and get it up and working, you cannot depreciate it over those two years. You are paying, you're going to just suffer that loss. You should be, when you get a new piece of equipment in a company, trying to get that thing working right away for you so you can start reducing depreciation. Okay? <coughs> So when I was working in, the, in Glaxo, the pharmaceutical company, the finance department really, they cared about two things. They cared about how much the check was for the equipment I was buying from Japan. And they were concerned about getting that equipment working right away so that they could start depreciating it. They wanted to know the very, the day, I had to be like, this day is when it started producing tablets. Anything prior to that, they, they cannot reduce their taxes on. Okay, so we have to be clear on those rules. So now let's go back to this equation here. And you can see where this is useful. So if a company wants to reduce their taxes, well, one way is that they earn less money. Okay? No one wants to do that. So companies are not going to reduce their income. But what they are going to do is try and increase their eligible expenses. These are things like salaries, paper, insurance costs. Okay? And they're also going to try and increase their depreciation. Well, let's take a look at how that depreciation is calculated now. So every period, you can reduce that tax by a depreciation amount. The government tells us how you can depreciate the equipment. And here's, the, here's how the Canadian government does it. Canada Revenue Agency, CRA, they don't call it depreciation. If you look it up on their website, you won't find very many hits. They go and call it CCA, Capital Cost Allowance. Okay, and it is very descriptive of what it is. It's the capital's cost, and they're giving you an allowance for it. They're allowing you to reduce the capital's cost. Okay? And they do it in a very, very cryptic way, as only the government could possibly do it. Let's go see how. Let's go look. If you go look at their website, class 10, so I'll, you can go look at it here. So here's the CRA's website. And if you click on class 10, you see it's 30% over there. I'll talk about that in a minute. And if you read that definition there for class 10, I've got it here. Um, class 10 is general purpose electronic data processing equipment, in brackets, commonly called computer hardware. And system software for that equipment, including ancillary data processing equipment. It's, it's very, very messy. The one that we're going to use the most is class 43. Class 43 reads, Let's go back up to here. And if we click on class 43, let's make it a little bit bigger. Class 43 has a CCA rate of 30% of eligible machinery and equipment used in Canada for the manufacture and process of goods for sale or lease. Okay? So a distillation column is producing methanol. It's for the production of goods in Canada. There's a bit of a complexity here. Anything that's not included in class 29 goes into class 43. And you can go read class 29. Class 29 was due to a tax break that was offered over a limited period of time um, that had slightly different depreciation rates. And I'll come back to that in two, three classes from now. Okay? But essentially, this is where most of our chemical engineering equipment is going to be in class 43. So a compressor, a pump, reboiler, distillation column, all of those things. And that 30% tells you how you can reduce and calculate the, the capital cost allowance. Okay, so capital cost allowance or, or depreciation is from when the equipment is put in service, when that equipment is producing product. So if I buy that equipment today and only next year I 
get it up and running. I cannot, re dedu uh, reduc I cannot reduce my income with depreciation in this financial year. I have to wait till next year when I'm using that equipment. So there's one other catch before we go into the detailed calculation. So again, the government is a step ahead of corporations. They will say, if we consider a period starting over here and ending over there, depreciation is calculated at 30% of the value of the equipment. Okay, so here's the start of your period, let's say 1st of January, and the last day is 31st of December. You could go buy that piece of equipment on the 24th of December and turn it on, and then reduce your income by 30% of the value of that equipment, even though you only used it for a very short period in the year. The government's like, no. no. You cannot do that. The government will assume that you've bought that equipment in the middle of the year, in the first year you buy it. And so the 50% rule is whatever depreciation you calculate using the, the percentage, so in our case the percentage is 30%, but you saw some of the other classes have different percentages. So you calculate your depreciation at the full rate, and for the first year you divide it by 2. Okay. So the government is always going to assume you bought the equipment in the middle of your period, is essentially what the 50% rule says. Devin. Um, if you buy it, let's say, this year, and then turn it on January 1st of next year, yeah. does the 50% rule still apply? Or do you yes. In fact, that's the worst thing to do, is to turn your equipment on the 1st of January, because then you only get the 50% rule applied to that whole period, even though you've used it for the entire period. The best thing to do is turn your equipment on the last day of the period and still get the 50% rule. Okay? If you think about it, because the moment you turn that equipment on, it's starting to degrade and the maintenance costs are going to start accumulating on it. So the best thing to do is turn your equipment on just before the end of the period. But companies generally don't play those sorts of games too much, but it is possible. Okay. So, the 50% rule holds and always should be applied. Now let's take a look at the formula for depreciation. And it simply is over there on, on slide 79. So let's explain it this way. You buy a piece of equipment right now. So we call that the book value. On the books, it has a value of a certain amount B naught. And you will multiply B naught, we're in, in period zero, by a percentage rate D. So the government tells you what that is. For that piece of equipment, you look up in the, on their website. So DN is the depreciation you get to write off in that nth period. The only exception is, of course, when you're in period zero, you get to write off half the value. Okay? So you write off some number of depreciation. Now, it's, if we consider January as your start of your period, and you've, that's your book value, you turn on the piece of equipment at the beginning of January, you run it till December, now you, on the, th the last day of the period, you calculate your revised book value, which is the original value minus half the depreciation amount. Then on the next day, in the start of the next period, the book value is the original book value minus the depreciation. So the next period, that equipment is worth less money. Then you just repeat that. Now your updated book value is the prior book value minus the depreciation, and then you go and multiply by the depreciation amount, D. Okay, and you just keep going. And what you'll notice then is that you're essentially declining the value of the equipment on a percentage scale, and you get, if you plotted the book value over time, it has that sort of shape. 
in an ideal world, but not quite because you only get to do this at the beginning and at the end of the period. So in fact, you get a staircase function that declines like that. So here's an example where you buy the equipment and put it in service on March. So that line only begins at March. January, February, nothing happens. March, you buy the equipment, turn it on, and you run it. At the end of the period, December, you get to redu reduce 50% due to depreciation. That book value now has reduced. Then you, at the end of that second period, the book value reduces again, but this time by the full depreciation amount, 30% of this value. This. And then the next period, you get to go down 30% of the prior book value, 30% of the prior book value. So every time you're taking smaller and smaller steps down. Eventually, up to infinity, this will reach zero, but never quite reaches zero. Okay, so go ahead and try out that formula using this example. Okay, so just to a note here, when I say work in rounded thousands, I mean that when you say a million, uh, ten million dollars, you would write it as ten thousand. Okay, this is another feature in this course. From this point onwards, our numbers are going to get large, right? And we don't want to keep writing all these zeros. So when we write ten million dollars in rounded thousands, you report it as ten thousand. It just saves you writing three extra zeros every time. Okay, what's the depreciation in the first period, N0? Any other on answers? Depreciation in the first period? 3,000? 1,500. Okay, so depreciation in that first period is 1,500. So let's just put a note. We don't want to clutter this up with calculations. So so put a note for us in your answer booklet. Number one is um, you just say 50% rule applies. So that means when you say 0 0.30, you get, whoops, you get 3,000 divide to, so just show us how you calculate that value. 
Okay, so at the end of that period, what is the book value? The end of period N0. 8,500. It is also the book value at the start of the next period. So 8,500 is the book value at the start of the next period. And again, let's just make a note there for ourselves and explain to us what, how you calculated that. And you can just write um, that book value in the nth period. We'd use this formula from up here. Book value in the nth period is equal to the book value in the nth minus one period minus the depreciation in the prior period. Okay, so in that equation, it's 10,000 minus 1,500. So that just explains to us how you got there. Okay, depreciation in the next period, uh, in, sorry, at the end of the first, uh, of the n equals one period, or second period. Any numbers? 2,500. Was it 2550, I think? Yeah, okay. So let's uh, make a note number three here. The book value in that period, uh, sorry, the depreciation is the depreciation percentage D times the book value, which is equal to 0.3, 30% depreciation times 8,500. Yeah. Okay, and then you can keep going to the next period, N2, N3, and so forth, and um, there's the spreadsheet for it. Oops. Let's go further down. Okay, so the spreadsheet then shows those, at least those first two rows, then propagating down. So here's the key, the key point. Other than the first period, which is always exceptional because of the 50% rule, notice that the depreciation amounts decline. So you write less and less and less off every year. Okay? The book value starts at 10,000 and decreases and will approach zero but never gets to zero. Because it's an exponential, it's always 30% of something, of something, of something. You never get exactly to zero. Okay, so that's what the blue curve is illustrating, is that the value of that equipment depreciates over time. The government doesn't really care whether or not in period N7, if you go and sell that distillation column or reboiler, this an example, they don't really care whether you can get a million dollars for it. Okay? It's just from the government's perspective, the value of that on your books is a million dollars. The government does that because they just, they're just interested in this number, the depreciation. You get to reduce your income earned. This is the key reason why we calculate depreciation. You get to reduce your income by 1.5 million in the first period. You get to reduce your income by 2.55 million in the second period. If you sum these all up, you will actually never really reduce your income by 10 million. Those sum it's never, never add up to it. Okay. But the government is giving you some break, just not, they're, they're just saying, you don't get to reduce your income by 10 million total. We'll cut up that 10 million in smaller and smaller pieces, and you get to reduce it over time. Okay. Joseph asked the important question, what if you take time value of money into account? Are you getting a good deal? Okay. So I'll leave that to kind of play around in your head over the weekend.